I don't have any desire to do a abstract painting at any time. I've had a desire to do forms, as when I originally did the three forms at the base of a crucifixion. I don't know if you would think of those as abstract or not. They were influenced by the Picasso things, which were done at the end of the 20s and the early 30s. And I think that there's a whole area, which in a way has been unexplored, of forms which are organic, a form that relates to the human image, but is a complete distortion of it. Mm. And I think there's a whole world there to be opened up, which of course was suggested by the Picasso. After the triptych of 1945, you started to paint in a more directly figurative way. I did, yes. Was this a more out of a positive feeling that you wanted to paint in a more figurative way or because you felt at that moment you couldn't develop that kind of uh, semi-abstract form further? Well, one of the pictures I did in 1946, which was a thing that's in the Museum of Modern Art. The butcher shop picture. Yes. It came to me as an accident. I was attempting to make a bird alighting on a field and it may have been bound up in some way with the three forms that had gone before, but suddenly the lines that I had drawn suggested something totally different, and out of this suggestion arose this picture. I had no intention to do this picture. I never thought of it in that way. It was like one continuous accident mounting on top of another. This often happens, does it, this transformation of the image in the course of working? It does. But now I always hope to arrive more positively. Now I feel, for instance, that I want to do very, very specific objects, and I want to make them from the most unillustrational forms, but that this image will suddenly arise out of something which is a complete accident to me and which I can't know, so that therefore it is always chance. And um, I hope to do some very much more specific things like portraits and that they will actually be portraits of the people, but when you come to analyze them, you just won't know or it'll be very hard to see how these things, how this image is made up at all. Mm. And this is why, in a way, it is very wearing because it is really a complete accident. An accident in what sense? because I don't know how the form can be made. I don't know. For instance, the other day I painted a head of somebody and the eyes, what made the sockets of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, when you analyze them, they were just forms which had nothing to do with eyes, nose, or mouth, but by the paint moving from one contour into another, it made a likeness of this person I was trying to paint. But I stopped and I thought for a moment I got something much nearer to anything I wanted. And then the next day I tried to take it further and tried to make it more poignant and more near and I lost the image completely. Because this image is a kind of tightrope walk between what is called figurative painting and abstraction in a way. And it will go right out from abstraction and it will have really nothing to do with it. Although, in a sense, of course, these things have been influenced by abstract painting, it's an attempt to bring the figurative thing up onto the nervous system more violently and more poignantly, if possible, which can't be done it's wrong to say it can't be done in purely figurative terms because, of course, it has been done. It has been done in Velasquez. And it's, of course, where Velasquez is so different to Rembrandt because, oddly enough, Rembrandt, if you take the great late self-portraits, you will find that in these great late self-portraits that the whole contour of the face changes time after time. It's a totally different face, although it has what is called a Rembrandt look mm. about it. A look of Rembrandt, but it is a totally different thing. And by these differences, it involves you in different areas of feeling. But with Velasquez? With Velasquez, it's more controlled and, of course, I believe, more miraculous. Because 
one wants to do this thing of just walking along the edge of the precipice. And in Velasquez, it's a very, very extraordinary thing that he has been able to keep it so near to what we call illustration and at the same time so deeply unlock the greatest and deepest things that man can feel, which makes him such an amazingly mysterious painter because one really does believe that when one looks at his pictures, one is possibly looking at something which was very, very near to how things looked. I think that the whole thing has become so distorted and pulled out since then that I believe that we will come back in a much more arbitrary way to doing something very, very like that, to being as specific as Velasquez was in recording a situation. But of course, the situation has become much more involved and much more difficult for very many reasons. And one of them is why photography has actually altered completely this whole thing of figurative painting. In a positive as well as a negative way? I think in a very positive way, because I think that Velasquez believed that he was recording the court at that time. But a really good artist today would be forced to make a game of the same situation, because he knows that with the film and the thing, that that particular thing could be recorded. So that that side of his activity has, in a way, been taken over by something else. And now, what he is involved with is making the sensibility open up through this situation that he is trying to record, rather than just record it. I think you see also that as man realizes that he is an accident and his futility, that he's a completely really futile being, that he has to play out the game without reason. I think that even when Velasquez was painting, even when Rembrandt was painting, in a peculiar way, they were still, whatever their attitude, to life was, they were still slightly conditioned by certain types of religious possibilities, which man now, you could say, has been completely cancelled out for him. Now, of course, man can only attempt to make something very, very positive by trying to beguile himself for a time by the way he behaves by prolonging possibly his life, by buying a kind of immortality through the doctors. You see, painting has now become, or all art has now become, completely a game by which man distracts himself. You may say it has always been like that, but now it's entirely a game. Mm. I think that that is the way things have changed. And now, what is fascinating actually is that it's going to become much more difficult for the artist because he must really deepen the game to be any good at all and return the onlooker to life more violently. I say it so badly like this. But it is one of the few games that man can play. Why was that recent triptych called the crucifixion? because I thought of it as a mood of a crucifixion. And without the crucifixion, I probably would never have done it. Without all the paintings that have been done in the past of the crucifixion, I would not have been able to do it. So you did have the idea of a crucifixion before you started it? I did, yes. And you also had the idea of doing a triptych? Yes. yes. Did you have the three canvases up simultaneously, or did you work on the different canvases separately? I worked on them separately. Gradually, as I finished them, I worked on the three across the room mm. together. Is there any sort of rational explanation of the iconography with those figures on the left? People have tried to find explanations. No. None at all? None. In fact, did it change a lot during the course of doing it? Was there always the reclining figure in the middle, and that figure sort of twisted over on the right, and the two men on the left? It didn't. It was a picture that I did in about a fortnight when I was in a bad mood of drinking 
and I did it under tremendous hangover and drink. I sometimes hardly knew what I was doing, and it's one of the only pictures I've been able to do yes. under drink. Yes. And in this picture, I think perhaps it helped me, because I believe that the drink helped me to be a bit freer. In one that you've done since, have you been able to do the same? I haven't, but I think with great effort I'm making myself freer. Hmm. I mean, you either have to do it through drugs or drink. Or extreme tiredness. Extreme tiredness, possibly, or will. Yes. So the will to make oneself completely free. Will is the wrong word, because in the end you could call it despair. Because it really comes out of absolute feeling of it's impossible to do these things, so I may as well just do anything. And out of this anything, one sees what happens. You did have the idea of the crucifixion, which gave a mood, but did you see the various forms in place before you started painting? I did, but they changed continuously. But I did see them, and the figure, the one on the, on the right, is something which I have wanted to do for a long time, you know the, uh, the great Chimabue crucifixion. Mm. I always think of that as, as a worm crawling down the cross. I did try to make some things which I've sometimes had from that picture of the feeling of this image just moving, undulating down the cross. You often find, don't you, that existing images start something off for you. I mean, yeah. there are these few things, the Velasquez Innocent the Tenth, the famous still from Potemkin, one or two other things like that. Yes. Do you think, in fact, most of your imagery begins from existing images? Well, very often they breed other images for me. What about movies? I mean, Eisenstein for you isn't just that still. No, I don't think so. Yeah, Eisenstein, the naturally, movies are very fascinating to me, but oddly enough, it's not so much the whole movie that's moving for me as certain shots and certain shots that are very often captured by papers or by these movie reviews or something like that. And they suggest all kinds of things to me, much more than the film itself. It's not so much the film that's exciting to me, but just fragments of it. So this thing is quite consistent with you. There are certain isolated images which seem to haunt you perpetually. These very severe art images, these seem to be in almost everything that recurs. Well, of course, one always loves the story and the sensation to be cut down to its most elemental state. Mm. That's how one longs for one's friends to be, isn't it? <laughs> one can do so much without the padding if they would only just give themselves straight and tell the story as precisely and as deeply so that you have the very precise story, which is deeply complicated and so difficult to find. The changes that occur to them, these transformations of these images, which happen by the time the painting is completed, do you foresee them before you begin the painting, or do they tend to occur while you're painting? You know, in my case, all painting, and the older I get, the more it becomes accident. So I foresee it in my mind, I foresee it, and yet I hardly ever carry it out as I foresee it. It transforms itself by the actual paint, and as we don't know about the fluidity of paint, we can't actually, I believe it's one of the things that I use very large brushes, and in the way I work, I don't in fact know very often what the paint will do. And it does many things which are very much better than I could make it do. And is that an accident? Perhaps one could say it's not an accident because it becomes a selective process. Which part of this accident one chooses to preserve? And one is attempting, of course, to keep the thing with the vitality of the accident. What is it above all that happens, perhaps one should say, not to the thing, but with the paint. This head I painted a few days ago, I was trying to paint on a specific person. In despair, I used a very big brush and with a great deal of paint, 
and I put it on very, very freely, and I simply didn't know in the end what I was doing, and suddenly this thing clicked and became exactly like this image I was trying to record. But not out of any conscious will, nor was it anything to do with <coughs> illustration of paper. But possibly there are ways of painting this way which are more poignant than illustration. This is one of the great difficulties, and it's never yet been analyzed as to why this should be. I suppose because it has a life completely of its own, outside anything to do with illustration, that it lives on its own, like the image one's trying to trap. It lives on its own, and therefore transfers the essence of the image more poignant. Because it is so many things at once, perhaps? Of course, yes. That is part of it. You want to do many more things than record an image. You want to open up so many levels of feeling. You were talking before about this painting you were doing the other day, and that you tried to take it further and lost it. Is this often the reason why you would have to destroy your paintings, most of which I believe you do destroy? Well, very often so. Do you tend to destroy the paintings early on, or do you tend to destroy them later, precisely when they've been good and you're trying to make them better? I think I tend to destroy the better paintings. They've all been better to a certain extent, and I try to take them further, and they lose all their quality, and they lose everything. I think I could say that I tend to destroy all the better paintings. Can you never get it back on a no. canvas? No. Can you explain why? As the way I work is totally now accidental and doesn't seem to behave as it were, unless it is accidental, how can I recreate an accident? But you might get another accident on the same canvas. One might get another accident, but it would never be quite the same because this is a thing that can only probably happen in oil paint because it is so subtle that one tone, one piece of paint, one tone that moves one thing into another completely changes the implication of the image. Hmm. Now, if you were to go on, wouldn't get back what you'd lost, but you might get something else. Now, why do you tend to destroy rather than to work on? Why do you prefer to begin on another canvas than to work on once the thing has gone over the top? Because sometimes then it disappears completely and the canvas becomes completely clogged and there's too much paint on it, just a technical thing, there's too much paint or something of that kind, and one just can't go on. It's a technical thing. It's a technical thing, yes. Is this because of the particular texture of your paint? I work between thick and thin paint. Parts of it are very thin and parts of it are very thick. And it just becomes clogged and then you start to put on illustrational paint. What makes you do that? Can you analyze the difference, in fact, between paint which conveys directly and paint which conveys through illustration. It's a very, very close and difficult thing to know why some paint comes across directly onto the nervous system and other paint tells you the story in a long diatribe through the brain. Yes. Most of your paintings have been a single figures or single heads. Yes. But in the crucifixion triptych, you did a complicated composition of several figures. Would you like to do that more often? I find it so difficult to do one that that <laughs> generally seems enough. And of course, I've got an obsession with doing the one perfect image. Which would have to be a single figure. In the complicated stage in which painting is now, the moment there are several figures, and there are several figures, on the same canvas, the story begins to be elaborated. And the moment the story is elaborated, the boredom sets in. And so that the story talks louder than the paint. Well, I think you avoided it marvelously in the crucifixion triptych. Yes, but don't forget they're painted on three different canvases, which already helps to avoid it. Yes. And, of course, people have, I gather, been trying to explain it, to make the picture tell a story, haven't they? I think so. Of course, so many of the greatest paintings have been done with a number of figures on a canvas. Of course, every painter 
longs to do that. And of course, any moment somebody will come along and be able to put a number of figures on a canvas. But it's so difficult to do one figure now. You don't want the story, but when you did that triptych, you started with the idea of getting the mood that corresponded to the crucifixion. It's very difficult to say about that. I've always been very moved by these pictures. There are very few of them about slaughterhouses and of meat. And to me, they belonged very much to the whole thing of the crucifixion. Well, like the Rembrandt, the... Uh... Exactly. And there have been more poignant things than that. There have been an extraordinary photograph which have been done of animals just being taken up before they were slaughtered. And the smell of death, we don't know, of course, but it appears by these photographs, the smell of death, that are so aware of what is going to happen to them. They do everything to attempt to escape. I think these pictures were very much based on that kind of thing, which to me is very, very near this whole thing of the crucifixion. I know for religious people, the Christian, the crucifixion has a totally different significance. But as a non-believer, it has just an act of man's behavior, way of behavior to another. But you do, in fact, paint pictures which are connected with religion because you paint, apart from the crucifixion, which is a theme you've painted and returned to for 30 years, from time to time, of course, the popes. Do you know why if you paint pictures that constantly touch on religion in this way? In the popes, I, it doesn't come from anything to do with religion. It comes from an obsessional thing with the photographs that I know of Velasquez Popes of Innocent the Tenth. But why was it you chose the Pope? Because I think it's to me one of the greatest portraits that's ever been made. It's a picture I've been always haunted by. I buy book after book with this illustration in it of the Velasquez Pope, and it opens up all sorts of feelings and areas of was their imagination even in me. But there are equally great portraits by Velasquez that you might have become obsessed by. Are you sure there's nothing for you in the fact of it being a Pope? I think it's the magnificent colour of it. And of course the Pope, it is true when you say it's a nothing. Of course the Pope is a unique, he's put into a unique position by being the Pope. And therefore, like certain great tragedies, he's as though raised onto a dais in which the grandeur of this image can be displayed to the world. As that, of course, it must have a tremendous attraction to painters. And there's the same uniqueness, of course, in the figure of Christ. Yes. So does it really come back to the idea of the uniqueness and the special situation, the special social situation of the tragic hero? That the tragic hero is necessarily somebody who is elevated above other men to begin well, with. Well, I had never thought of it in that way, but when you suggest it to me, I think it may be so. You do tend, several things you've said suggested, in beginning a painting or a series of paintings, to have an idea of the kind of affect, of the kind of mood that you want to get in. Oh, yes, I do. I see rooms full of paintings. They just fall in like slides. I can daydream all day long and see rooms full of paintings, and I see these paintings. But whether I ever make them really like what drops into my mind, I don't know, because of course they fade away. But the whole mood drops in, certainly. And it is a mood that you want above all. No, I think, especially as I grow old, I want something much more specific than like that. I want the record of an image. And with the record of the image, of course, comes the mood. Because you can't make an image without you creating a mood. Mm. A record of an image, what? Of, of something you've seen in life, in reality? Yes. Of a person or a thing. It was me, nearly always somebody or something. Either a portrait or a figure. And they relate to a particular person? They do, yes. How do you find it working from nature? painting a portrait from nature? I find it very, very difficult 
generally, I can only do it to begin with by being a person and then afterwards, by accident, make it. The two self-portraits, were they painted in a mirror or from memory? Out of your head. Out of my head. Why do you like to blaze your painting? There are two reasons. I like to cut them by glass and cut them away from their surroundings. And another thing is, as I work on the reverse side of the canvas, and a great deal of the canvas is only stained, and it's impossible to give it a texture with varnish or anything, which might bring up the life of it, by actually glazing them, I feel it gives an added depth and texture to the quality of the type of paint that I use. Because you can't put an ordinary wax varnish on. Not possibly, no. I couldn't do the particular kind of thing I'm trying to do, which is to make a chaos in an isolated area with varnished pictures or with other types of paint. I need this absolutely thin, stained background against which I can do this image that I'm trying to do and have never really achieved. Is it because you want to get a chaos in an isolated area that you often use this rectangular frame around the figures? I use the rectangular frame to see the image for no other reason. I know it's been interpreted as being many other things. As a glass box, for example. I never think of it as such. Perhaps... Do you remember that people said that when Eichmann was in his glass box, you would prophesize this in paintings of yours? No, I cut down the scale of the canvas by drawing in these rectangles, which concentrate the image down. But it's never had any sort of illustrative intention? It hasn't, no. But you'll just be able to see the face, to see the image, in fact, more clearly. I don't think it's a satisfactory device, especially. I try to use it as little as possible, but sometimes it seems necessary. Do you think that when you did this recent triptych, again, these are the three canvases, and the lines coming down between them, had the same sort of purpose. I do, yes. They isolated one from the other, and they cut off the story between one and the other. You paint a lot in the series, don't you? I do, yes. Partly because I see every image all the time in a shifting way, and almost in shifting sequences, so that one can take it from more or less what is called ordinary figuration to a very, very far point where you hope that by taking this thing right out, that you will return to the poignancy of the image from which you are trying to take it more violently. To what extent is the series a whole for you? Ideally, I'd like to paint rooms of pictures, which were a series of different subject matter, but treated serially. Do you do them one after the other, or do you work on them simultaneously? No, I do them one after the other. One's just the other. The last one starts the next one. Yes. Now, when you've done the last one, do you turn it to the wall and start afresh, or do you sometimes look at the last one while you're starting the next one? Oh, I do. I'm very conscious of the one that's gone before when I'm doing the next one. So that it's almost as if you were painting the same picture, but on a different canvas for the sort of technical reasons that you talked about before. Of course. What in a curious way one's always hoping to do is to paint the one picture which will annihilate all the other ones, yes. and so that you will be able to concentrate it into one painting. But there's a curious thing about that, that actually the series, one reflects on the other continuously, and sometimes they're better as series than they are separately. Mm. Perhaps, unfortunately, I've never yet been able to make the one image that sums up all the others, so that one image against the other tells the story particular kind of thing more precisely. Have you had any desire to do an abstract painting at any time? I've had a desire to do forms, as when I originally did the three forms at the base of a crucifixion. I don't know if you would think of those as abstract or not. They were influenced by the Picasso things, which were done at the end of the 20s and the early 30s, 
And I think that there's a whole area which in a way has been unexplored of forms which are organic, a form that was on earth, the butcher shop picture. Yes, it came to me as an accident. I was attempting to make a bird alighting on a field and it may have been bound up in some way with the three forms that had gone before, but suddenly the lines that I had drawn suggested something totally different, and out of this suggestion arose this picture. I had no intention to do this picture. I never thought of it in that way. It was like one continuous accident mounting on top of another. It relates to the human image, but is a complete distortion of it. Mm. And I think the whole world there to be opened up, which of course was suggested by the Picasso. After the triptych of 1945, you started to paint in a more directly figurative way. I did, yes. Was this a, more out of a positive feeling that you wanted to paint in a more figurative way or because you felt at that moment you couldn't develop that kind of um, semi-abstract form further? Well, one of the pictures I did in 1946, which was a thing that's in the museum of... This often happens, does it, this transformation of the image in the course of working? It does. But now I always hope to arrive more positively. Now I feel, for instance, that I want to do very, very specific objects, and I want to make them from the most unillustrational forms but that this image will suddenly arise out of something which is a complete accident to me and which I can't know, so that therefore it is always chance. And um, I hope to do some very much more specific things like portraits, and that they will actually be portraits of the people, but when you come to analyze them, you just won't know, or it will be very hard to see how these things, how this image is made up at all. Mm. And this is why, in a way, it is very wearing, because it is really a complete accident. An accident in what sense? Because I don't know how the form can be made. I don't know, for instance, the other day,